Good morning and welcome to 10 Years Hence. Our speaker this morning is Nitesh Chala. Professor Chala is the Frank M. Fryman Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and Director of the Research Center on Network and Data Sciences and the Data Inference Analytics and Learning Lab at the University of Notre Dame. He started his tenure track career at Notre Dame in 2007 and quickly advanced from assistant professor to an endowed full professor position in 2016. He has brought in over $19.5 million in research funding to the university. He has published over 180 papers with over 10,600 citations. His research is focused on data science, machine learning, and network science. His work has also led to transformative interdisciplinary applications in healthcare, environmental and climate sciences, education, and national security. A theme of his research program is big data and data sciences for the societal benefit. He is passionate about driving technological innovations to augment human intelligence and bridge the last mile challenge for the common good. He has received numerous awards for research, scholarship, and teaching. He is the recipient of the 2015 IEEE CIS Outstanding Early Career Award, the IBM Watson Faculty Award, the IBM Big Data and Analytics Faculty Award, and National Academy of Engineering New Faculty Fellowship. His work was also noted in PSFK Future of Health Innovation. His PhD dissertation also received the Outstanding Dissertation Award. He is a two-time recipient of the Outstanding Teaching Award at Notre Dame. In recognition of the societal and community-driven impact of his research, he was recognized with the Rodney Ganey Award and Michiana 40 Under 40. He is a fellow of the Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values, fellow of the Institute of Asia and Asian Studies, and fellow of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at Notre Dame. He is the founder of Analytics, a data science software company. Please join me in welcoming Professor Chala. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the uh, really generous uh, in introduction. So, uh, so we're going to sort of talk about today is, and, and you mind if I'm just going to step down and walk amongst you folks. Uh, so we're going to talk about today is what does it mean from a human machine partnership that you know, we are thinking about AI going 10 years forward. We are thinking about autonomous driving, autonomous systems, robots, and everything else. But my, our thinking is that we still have to figure out what the human and machine partnership would look like, what the human and AI system and how they will work together, how they will, you know, frame ideas together, how they will create and think about the future together. And it also means that as we think as computer scientists or engineers or, or business uh, school students and faculty here, we are really good in creating the future, right? We can, we can develop innovation, we can create new technology, we can build uh, fantastic robots, we can build driverless cars, but we also have to think about the future, right? What do these innovations result in? What does that mean that when we have a driverless car with a driver car on the road? What does it mean when we have algorithms and machine learning and AI powering uh, certain systems? And what is, and, you know, we are seeing that even with, as we build these social media platforms, the disinformation campaign that started with, the, on Facebook and Twitter, the social media platforms weren't designed for that, right? They were built to share, be, be connected, uh, accumulate users, but now there is also a negative use of the disinformation campaign that we keep hearing about. So how do we sort of begin to think about that from that perspective? And that sort of is what I would be uh, you know, th thinking a lot about more together with all of you here uh, indeed for the next uh, uh, hour or so. Uh, and uh, uh, Jim in, the, in his previous lecture talked about you know, the, the, no the innovation that we have seen in robotics. Right? He, was fo he was focusing on the energy actuator systems and how do we build a mechanical framework to sort of work together. And he, he shared uh, uh, the video of bloopers of robots as well with you folks. And what was really interesting was those videos of robots failing drew empathy, laughter, and even sympathy from all of you, right? Now imagine if we humans failing would, would 
with those and with us humans failing in ties, same emotions from the robots. Right? I, I saw the video and there was laughter, there was uh, empathy. So let's sort of think about what the history of these robots really has, has come to be. So this was in 1950s. Sandia National Labs was trying to develop, this is like a human machine partnership here. Sandia National Labs was trying to build a robot to actually help with the radioactive material that was uh, in the mix. And I, I quote here from the press release so I can be precise here what they said. So the press release announcing the robot called it a replacement for man. Or there should be a replacement for person. But in fact, the robot had no autonomy. It was teleoperated by a human sitting in front of a massive control console connected to the robot by a 60 meter cable. The Mark I version of the robot had a pair of meter long, hydraulically actuated arms capable of lifting up to 68 kilograms or 150 pounds, along with adjustable length grippers. And the entire system was mounted on a forklift about 50, 60 years ago is where we were. And this was, you know, this was the innovation, the remote robot, the mobile robot, however, was connected by a wire. And then, you know, back, and now in 2015, we see a robot like this. There is no human attached to it. The robot seems fairly autonomous. And this was the DARPA grand challenge in robotics as well at that time. And the DARPA grand challenge in robotics sort of brought home the, you know, and the, you saw the bloopers video, the failures video that you folks saw last time. Uh, had some of the snippets from this, where the robots would fall, they would fail. They were not, they, the uncertainty in the environment wasn't quite working out. One error could lead to a catastrophic failure, one error. Uh, and so how, what is it, so now as we are building out these robots where we are moving away in 50 years from this to this, what does the next 50 years bring? Do, would we fully have autonomous robots from that perspective? What is the software component of this intelligence going to be like? And that's something for us to think about. And then this was a, so this was a community memory. So if you think about, so this was back in 1972, right? A, there was, a, there was a, a flyer in San Francisco that said, community memory is the name we give to this experimental information service. It is an attempt to harness the power of the computer in the service of the community. We hope to do this by providing a sort of super bulletin board where people can post notices of all sorts and can find the notices posted by others rapidly. And this was by Loving Gray Cybernetics, was a group of Berkeley people operating out of resource one and not for profit. And this sort of, this is what the community memory back in the 1970s looked like. And the purpose of this was the bulletin boards. Purpose of this was sharing information. To post something costs you money, right? Now we, we take that for granted, right? We're sharing, posting information, recommendation is easy. And now what we call community memory is Siri. Hey Siri, tell me about AI and I get my answer. It doesn't matter from where it's coming from. Siri is my, is my community memory. Siri is my bulletin board. Siri, or Alexa, or, or what you, what you, or choose what, you, what your favorite a service may be. So this is, in 30, 40 years, we have gone from this to this, right? And yet, and, but there are still challenges with voice. How do we interpret voice, the natural language, the accents that go with it? There's some training that goes with it, but this is where, this is our community memory. Whether it's your Siri or your Alexa or your HomePod or your Google device, what have you, right? So this is, this, and it's shrinking, right? But the power of computing is significantly increasing. And then something else that, as an AI, we basically have come to, as, as a system which we use every day, is powered by AI, machine learning, is Amazon, right? When we, when we think about recommendations, when we think about, hey, I buy a book, what are the books? It tells me what other books should I buy. And I go and buy those books. Why? Because Amazon said, I must buy that book. It must be good, right? And we do it. And that's the business model. Right? It's a $100 billion gentleman called Jeff Bezos now, right? Built on harnessing the community memory, the community preferences, the data that all of us generate, right? We purchase, we tell, we generate the reviews, we generate everything. We give the star rating to the books or the products, and we, we are providing content. I think we should get some dividend as well, right? 
for doing all that work. But, you know, but that's the idea of how do we now create similarities across millions of individuals to power a recommendation system. So I searched for, the, when I was in uh, grad school, I, you know, I studied AI from Rust, Stuart Russell and Norvig book. And then it said, hey, you buy these two books together because deep learning is a love of the year now, right? Uh, and we, you, 150, and it said, oh, by the way, these other books may be of interest to you as well, right? And how do we sort of begin to, so these are the recommendations, and if I buy two or three other books, bingo, right? And, and it sort of challenged the traditional brick and mortar experience where we said, all right, Barnes, the Borders bookstore, the Barnes and Nobles bookstore became coffee shops if they survived. Right? So this is how the, the information, the technology, the data, and, the, and the, the, the power of AI has been transforming businesses. Netflix is another thing. You know, I watch their show, it'll recommend me 10 other shows, and hopefully I binge watch them overnight. Right? And then you know, everyone is happy, including me. So, so the idea here, with, even with Netflix, is that it, it sort of is an AI system. It's a machine learning system that we are touching. This is the state of the affairs today. It's not just in robotics. It's not just in autonomous systems and cars. But every single technology we are touching using has a feel of AI or machine learning in it. It's also doing the same thing, looking at your watching behavior, your watching preferences, and it's generating recommendation. It's personalizing your experience based on these are the movies you may like. And by doing that, by leveraging that AI or technology that goes with it, you know, put all the other brick and mortar video renting experiences out of business, right? Or uh, DVDs are so old fashioned now, right? Uh, I still have some video cassette tapes. I'm not sure if you guys know what those are, but you know, they are those things which you insert in a VCR and, uh, and you watch, but you know, of course, they're in a VCRs now. But, so, but, you know, but the technology is advanced where things are shrinking, right? Things are shrinking where we are sort of able to watch and carry this movie going experience with me wherever I go. I search for AI. And it suggested 20 other things or what have you. And uh, I'm not sure how Travelers is related to where. Maybe it is. I haven't seen it. But you know, most of the other movies, you can see that you know, yes, there, has, uh, there is, at least by title, some relationship with, with AI or the people who may have watched AI. Pandora has this music genome project, which is phenomenal, where it's the most comprehensive analysis of music that's ever been undertaken. Again, these are services which we all use. And we are being touched by AI in all our experiences. And we are the data generators. Not only we are the consumers, but we are the producers as well. Where we produce what move music I may like, what kind of, you know, what compositions I may like, what kind of lyrics I may like, what kind, and then they figure out, at the, they, they have broken it down with this music genome project. Think about the human DNA. They have a music DNA now where they can say, okay, what are the genetic or molecular level uh, similarities across this music, where it's not just based on genre or, or group or, or the lyric or etc. They have broken it down even further. And this is the largest project out there. And how do they know that? Because millions of us on our smartphones, we are listening to the music. And based on what we tend to listen to more, it's generating similarities across. These are the ways we may be, the music may be similar. Just the ways we become, we have, we, we share similarities, whether on a genetic uh, origin or ethnicity origin or, or, or uh, uh, healthcare or the lifestyle behaviors, music shares the same. It's, in, it's my preference and what are the similarities that may drive it. So that's another really cool example. And then Analytics, the company that, that I founded here in, uh, uh, in, uh, in South Bend, it's a, a five-year-old company. You know, so we are building up AI, data science, software, and solutions. And, and, and what we are basically is, is essentially driving the entire consumer journey by, build, by figuring out how do we rethink data? Where the machines and software and the systems are building this data, how do we leverage this data to power actionable insights, to power a, a, an analyst journey, to power a data scientist journey, to make it easier to, to figure out how we can build all of these things together? And we are seeing whether, and, and the applications range from either of marketing to IoT, Internet of Things, et cetera. But all of these are creating and producing data. So this is, so what I'm basically trying to do here is sort of walk us through a state of the current affairs so we can see where we have to project to uh, going in the future. 
Another uh, application that, you know, area that's becoming internet of everything, internet of things, where everything would be connected. I'll walk home and my refrigerator would say, welcome home, Nitesh, milk is over. Why didn't you get it before you walked in home? You're such a loser, right? Of course, it'll have more empathy, but, you know, uh, but, you know, but it's, it's, it's sort of where you're thinking about smart kitchens. You're thinking about, you know, on your, on your, on your smartphone, you have a complete sense of, uh, you know, who's ringing your bell or, or where, what's in your refrigerator? Is your dishwasher uh, finished? Is your uh, washing machine uh, finished uh, uh, washing your clothes? Or is the dryer blocked? All of these smart appliances are in the market today, powered by the Internet of Things, powering our journey, powering our experiences. And in five years from now, it won't be, I, I imagine seeing the largest genome of food recipes. We imagine all our refrigerators 10 years from now, if our refrigerators, you know, with the food and the things that we cook, et cetera, are drying similarities, what kinds of recipe recommendations, ingredient re recommendations could be generated as a result as well. So now the internet or the system or the intelligence system knows my movies experiences, knows my the books, the products I purchase, knows the music, and soon what I eat. Right? Life is going to be good, right? Uh, everything would be recommended to me. Everything would be taken care of. And I just have to figure out how I live in that world. And that's a human-machine partnership that, that's going to come to emerge. Nest uh, is the, uh, the one on the left. Uh, is, uh, you know, is powered by Google AI. And Google acquired the company, so Google apps are powering it. It's, again, a very intelligent system. On the right, Lighthouse came out which, uh, with its own camera, which basically is saying, I'm going to take on Amazon and I'm going to take on Google uh, and see what we can do. So, so essentially, we are seeing this, this now in our homes. The next frontier, the, the initial frontier of AI was, in, my, in terms of application from a business perspective or a, or a general use perspective, was you know, with the Amazon, Google uh, search engine doing, uh, uh, doing a web search for us on Netflix or Pandora. Now it's about our home, our lifestyle. Right? And how do we, again, make it all operate in the right construct, under the right framework from that perspective? Tesla is, you know, the, you know, is driving us uh, through the roads now and is giving us intelligence and this is the image recognition that's uh, uh, happening in Tesla. It's fully a software-oriented car, right? So Tesla is, is, is sort of, you know, chartering this thing and people are, you know, saying, hey, the driver-less cars are safer and, you know, the driver cars are maybe have more accidents. And yes, perhaps, the, you know, to me, to solve that problem could be we avoid, we don't let us humans drive, right? We are the distraction. We may not stop fully for three seconds on a stop sign. We may try to gun through the yellow just when it's turning red, just because we can. A machine could be programmed to stop for three seconds. You see yellow, you stop. It's not going to be reading text messages. It's not going to be doing anything else, eating behind the wheels. Right? The machine is not going to do all that. So if we have all driverless cars, then yes, the roads may be safer. It's, I believe, us human drivers that are messing up the driverless cars. So we need to fix us here, uh, not the software, because the software is, is, is ready and it's so, sort of able to understand what's going on from that perspective. The other really cool application in my view, and this has been in the works for a very long time, is in the area of healthcare, right? Where this is from IEEE Spectrum, where it talks about where AI wins, where it's a tie, where doctors win. Right, where you know, if you have to diagnose pneumonia, you have to be using looking at images or diagnose heart attacks and strokes or, or autism by looking at observations, AI is doing well. Right? And we as we move towards the right, the doctors are winning. And where it's in the middle is where some of the things are. So this is based on IEEE spectrum sort of accumulated a lot of these research studies and this and said where is the AI dominance happening? Think about radiology, right? If you if I have images. And there is no fatigue ever. There is no radiologist fatigue that the AI system will have. We'll run through it, run through it, run through it. So now if there's no, so if I'm, all I'm looking for is where the, where the cancer may be, what may be broken, if I'm analyzing images, and I can train the system to be, to be powerful if I'm looking at x-rays of, of the lung, then perhaps I may be able to realize that you know, I can, AI may win in terms, of, in terms of the image analysis. 
But on the other hand, for general diagnosis, right, where there is that interaction that's very important with the physician, that empathy, that communication, that understanding and listening where the concerns may be, that, is, that cannot be possibly replaced. Some of the more technical tasks could be, but the human interaction, and that's another point I'd like you to think about as we think about the future, where we where our thinking should be or could be. So, but again, as we think about AI in medical space, there have been significant advances, including in my group, we have developed systems and algorithms for personalized healthcare. We have figured out how we can, and it's the same idea, our personalized healthcare system basically works on the same premise as Amazon or Netflix. Amazon tells you, you go to the Amazon recommendations, recommendation system, it says these are the books or movies you, uh, uh, or products you may like. Netflix recommends these are the movies you may like. Pandora says this is the music you may like. We say in our disease system, these are the diseases you would like, right? And we recommend diseases to you. Now, of course, we won't do that, but, but that's the idea is we can build our similarities based on our data. If diseases represent our lifestyle, our, our, uh, uh, our environment, our socioeconomic factors, if 80% of the factors that are responsible for my disease are my lifestyle, all of us share some similarities on those fronts. Where we live, where we are, what lifestyle we may have, what behaviors we may entertain, et cetera. So we have similarities. So the same ideas apply uh, even to that front. So, so we can sort of think about where medicine and healthcare is already we are seeing significant advances. And just to give you an idea, right? Initially, there was this thing about Chess, right? When we, were, when we were trying to build a machine learning algorithms or AI systems, we were very focused on, all right, can we beat chess, right? Chess requires, you know, this advanced thinking, knowledge, or skill game. Until about 2006, 2007, we had the first win. And since then, gosh, there's endless systems which, which can beat a computer, which can beat a human uh, in ch on chess. Right? So, so now you can see where, and this was where the human benchmark performance was. Right? And this is where people struggled, and, and then you know, now it's a solved problem in many ways. This was another challenge problem. Right? Can, if the human can recognize images, how well machines can do. And this was the error rate, so lower is better. As you can see, it wasn't until 2016 that we could be developed algorithms and techniques where they were better than humans. So if you think about five years, it took us to perfect an algorithm in image recognition. And now, with the same deep learning methods, we are saying, oh, if I perturb the pixels and if I change something, the deep learning algorithm may not do as well, right? Where there could be an adversarial imputation of it. So we are continuing to make advances on it. But now advances are more happening in the world of uncertainty, in the world of adversary you know, injecting some data in the system. So again, so this is sort of give you an idea of where we have been, where we have come. And in the recently, in the New York Times, uh, I guess um, there have been various news pieces on, on this. Just a yes, just couple of days ago, uh, uh, there was, we may soon be living in Alexa's world. Uh, in, to give AI the gift of gab, Silicon Valley needs to offend you to understand how you react. Because conversational bots, the chat bots, is the next frontier of AI. To be able to understand your context, although we hate it when we call a system and it says, if you tell me what you need, I shall direct you to the right person. Right? And you keep hitting 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 until you go to the right person. Right? Because the system has not been working. Right? So this is where chatbots and conversational AI is the next frontier. Right? We, have, we have figured out chess, we have figured out recommendations, we can collect the data, we can do consumer-related retail side of things well, we can do finance side of things. Now it's the human side of things. What does that mean to us in terms of AI? And, it, and I think that's where it will be in the next five to 10 years. And the other thing, of course, is AI is getting cheaper. That's also bad news. Right? So this drone made by a company called Skydio can follow a person without human interaction and uses available parts and open source software. 
So you could soon have you know, these little, your little drones flying over you and you're having conversation. Imagine a life where your drone is flying with you having conversation with the drone. Yeah, the weather is awful today, I know. You know, I'm going to, what should I be doing for my test today? And the drone is feeding you information as you're walking to your class, right? So that becomes a conversational bot where, you know, we have this, you see software, et cetera. Google Translation was a great AI awakening back in 2016. Again, in New York Magazine, uh, uh, well, New York Times Magazine, it was, and how Google Translate, and yet if you have used Google Translate or any other translation service, you realize they are these, you know, col the colloquial use of a language is very difficult to translate. Right? But this is again, so AI is touching our lives, or we are touching AI in many different ways, and we soon have to figure out a new way of operating ourselves, of functioning together, partnership, teaming together with these AI systems because they will be in our home. We may soon be living in Alexa's world. I, th and, uh, uh, the, I, I think the, uh, the, one of the best ad in the NFL this time was the Alexa's ad, right? Where he says, Alexa, and there's somebody, a human out there trying to have a conversation with you. So, so with that sort of a, a sense of, so think about this is where we are today. So if you think about AI advances, where AI, machine learning, big data, data science, whatever you want to call it, right? Whatever is the love of the year, whatever is the, uh, the taxonomy or the terminology of the year of the present that we're going for, that's the state of affairs today. From the internet to our experiences from a social media, social perspective, from a, a consumer perspective, from smart home perspective, from interaction, from image recognition perspective, et cetera. So where does it take us from here? If I tell you this is what AI has achieved, and let's think about the next 10 years building on these foundations, what would be some of the challenges? Now, of course, as a community, if I ask each one of us here, that's why giving this 10 years hence is, is a viewpoint of person one in many ways, right? Or what my bias may be in this. But because we all may come up with different frameworks, different things. So these three authors, or four or five authors, from Future of Humanity at Oxford, Political Science at Yale University, and AI Impact, surveyed a bunch of machine learning and NIPS, some ICML and NIPS are some of our primary conferences, surveyed the individuals in that conference and asked them questions about what they think the future brings, right? And this was the sort of, you know, uh, the probability of human level machine intelligence, what that means is that the machines will have the human level intelligence, which means they are capable of lifelong learning. We humans are capable, let's forget our emotions, empathy, feelings, intuition, gut, all the other feel, feelings that we may have. Let's just think about us as learners. We are capable of lifelong learning. We embed incorporate new training experiences, and we make useful changes to the working of our mind. That's what learning is. Marvin Minsky says, learning is making useful changes to the working of our mind, as simple as that. Now, whether you go to one class, you go to your professional life, you go to uh, a lecture as this, this may be the best lecture you've ever had. If not, still tell me it is. Uh, but, you know, but the point is that that's what we do, the human level machine intelligence. And this were, you know, Years from 2016, and this was the data from experts in machine learning, in neural networks, in deep learning, uh, scientists, academics, and what they had to say, and the 95% confidence intervals. So this is the variability of where people thought it could achieve, 100 years, somewhere at 100 years from now, right? And the probability of it, maybe in 50 years, we had about 50% probability with some confidence intervals. In 10 years, we really are uh, let's figure out image recognition and noise and things like that, you know, conversational AI. So, so to really get that human level machine intelligence, if that's the ultimate frontier, this is the 21st century challenge for us, right? And this does require many different faculties of mind and, and thinking and disciplines to come together. It is not a computer science problem, it is not a business problem, it is not a, you know, it is a cognitive science problem, it's a computer science problem, it's a business problem, it's an electrical engineering problem, it's a mechanical engineering problem, it's a, a natural sciences problem, it really is everyone's problem. To get to that level of human level machine intelligence, we have to understand. Because remember, 
once we get the human level of machine intelligence to achieve the goal of lifelong learning, then we have to figure out, now how do you take that machine in context of other machines and humans, their relationships? How do you sort of work on those? And this is, uh, I'm hoping that, you know, so, so these were some of the other activities they broke it down, right? Where they said, can they do a New York, can they write a New York Times bestseller? And they said, oh, in 25 years, people were very confident. Can they play a game? Yes, go, defeat on go, yes, it's done. And they basically broke it down, full laundry, world series of poker, angry birds, transcribed speech, ghost, five kilometer race in a human, a bipedal robot versus human. Imagine in a 5K, robots are signing up and your task is to beat the robot. Right? Uh, so, so that's where you can, we can we get there. To be a truck driver, to generate top 40 poppy song, pop songs, to be a surgeon, right? Would you go to a surgeon, right? I mean, there are already things that exist which can write, machines can write paper, research papers for you as well. They figured out how to write research papers and they can fool the conference reviews sometimes. Um, but you know, so, so there is, so if these were the tasks, so what I liked about this research study is it's, it's publicly available is they broke it down and they're sort of getting perceptions, opinions. It's not the, the scientific soundness to it is perception of, of, of opinions and they applied statistical uh, uh, tests to ensure that the bias and small sample size and things were mitigated. But, but this is really interesting where things have a longer range to them. Not just 10 years, they have a much longer range associated to them as we go through the challenge. And maybe as we go through this challenge, we may achieve this goal where you're sitting in the car and studying for your test and the car is taking you to destination. Or, or we have the idea of flying cars, where the flying cars may take you around. One of our former students, Jake Lucier, was my uh, undergrad student here, you know, went on to get his PhD at uh, Stanford. Uh, as I said, went on to get. When you go to Stanford, you don't sometimes finish, you just drop out and do a startup. That's what he did. Uh, and he's sort of looking at flying cars, right? That's what he's trying to imagine the future where there could be flying cars, and which is phenomenal, right? Where he's trying to think about the technology, the algorithms that may work. And, and another of my former students, uh, uh, Jim Notwell, also got his P went for PhD at, at Stanford. He finished it. But he's sort of figuring out how light embedding can rewire our neurons. And that may help us with Parkinson. Right? So they have funding now in the private sector, in the, in the Silicon Valley, to push some of these frontiers uh, to go on. And ultimately, maybe, hopefully, we will get to a point where we will have an oracle who will have all the answers. Right? We'll be the master of Siri, Alexa, Google, HomePod, take, take everything pulled together, and we come to this oracle, and that gets the answer. Or even better, right? we saw Iron Man in last week's talk, but if we have Jarvis, just a rare, very intelligent system. Wasn't that Jarvis who was sort of, to me, the best human-machine partnership is Iron Man. That guy rocks, for crying out loud. But even more, a bigger rock star is Jarvis, right? Figures out, tells him he is reading his parameters and everything else, and if we can get there, right? But that's sort of the ultimate, you know, if we can get to these conversational systems where Jarvis is assimilating data, getting my biosensors, figuring out, and making me perform better making me an Iron Man, then we truly have achieved that, or I can go, and that's the future. If all of the innovation that we are talking about can converge to these two visions, we have, this is the moonshot idea. Jarvis is the moonshot idea. Right back in the 19, when, uh, when, Ken, when John F. Kennedy said, take the man to the moon, NASA's mission was one statement, take the man to the moon. There were no other 20 other mission statements, but that required them to figure out how to build the right rocket, what the trajectory would be, what the equations would be, what the software would be. All of those became goals. But all of that didn't matter if the man didn't go to the moon. Right? So if we are trying to go for Jarvis, just a rather very intelligent system, and to do so, we have to make advances on AI, on health, on sensing, on our uh, conversational AI, on, on empathy on feelings, on intuition. If that's a moonshot idea, oh, there'll be many, 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 many advances in AI from now to then. With, and that, to me, is the 21st century goal in many ways. So the core challenge, so I bring it all to say that the core challenge is the human-machine partnership. How are we going to think about that? How are we going to handle that? How are we going to bring about that? And you know, if you think so this fits list, it, it was a paper back in 1951, but still makes a lot of sense, right? 
The human have detection, perception, judgment, induction, improvisation, and a long-term memory. Right? A machine, and this was back in 51, but still holds. Short-term memory, simultaneous operator operations, replication, computation, speed, and power. will work faster than the human will do this. How do we begin to converge these two together? Right? And if these two have to operate, we're going to continuously make a lot of advances in this. Right? And the human is going to evolve at the human space. Right? This thing will evolve much faster to where we are today with terms of machines. So how is it all going to come together for us? And so the, a challenge here is how do we, and what I'd like you to imagine is a team, a heterogeneous teams. Right? Imagine in, on a battlefield, right? soldiers are carrying their backpacks, which have the communication equipment. And, and today, what's going, to hap what's going to happen in five, 10 years is perhaps uh, you know, UAVs, UGVs go in an uncharted terrain. It's a very complex world where wars may be in a complex urban environment where you have no idea. You haven't done a reconnaissance yet to understand what the complexity of the terrain may be. You may have UAVs, UGVs with intelligence going in doing an ISR, a, a reconnaissance, and then they communicate back to the humans, and then the humans go with follow after. And if one UAV or UDV is compromised, what happens? What if you are not communicating, there is cyber communications happening, what if that channel is, or the bandwidth is clogged by the enemy? What happens? So when you have a team of this complexity working in a very complex environment, what are some of the challenges? And, and truly, we have, there's a lot of fundamental challenges to even achieve that Jarvis vision. A very basic challenges exist in distributed intelligence, where there'll be different layers of intelligence associated with different individuals, devices, UAVs, UGVs, name it, right? There will be a autonomy. Can we build a robot? Can we build a machine which is going to be fully autonomous, which is going to sense what is going on, figure out what needs to be done, and then take a decision. Imagine that, let's say you know, the UAV goes into an enemy area. It starts getting retaliatory fire. And it's on a humanitarian ground. But they, it's, a, it's, it's going on a, as a military humanitarian mission, goes in an urban area to figure out where some of the challenges are. There are some uh, adversaries who start firing at it from a hospital compound. And now if the UAV is autonomous, what should the UAV do? Retaliate with the risk of collateral damage at the hospital? Or who is responsible for that decision? The human, the UAV, what have you. So these are, when we think about autonomy, you have to think about these extreme situations where a, a decision one way or the other could impact, could lead to collateral damage in many ways. Cooperation. How do we now cooperate? Among, cooperation among humans is difficult enough. Now humans and machines have to cooperate together. How do we solve that challenge? Control and adapt. How do we adapt to changing environments around us? How can we control these functions? How can we control the systems? Right? So we have to, at the scientific level, to achieve the idea of heterogeneous team which are responding to high cadence, high precision, uncertain, and adversarial environments, oh, there are many, many, there are many, there's bountiful of research to be done here. And then we may achieve that goal of heterogeneous teaming in, in the next 10 years. And, so, and, and we are doing that at, uh, in, my, in our research program is, so we are sort of, you know, we are trying to build and we were responding to a research proposal. So this figure is from the research problem where imagine a world where you have, uh, and it's from, a, uh, from an army research lab perspective, where you have a complex and contested environment, you have deployment over large areas, rapid operational tempo, you gotta take a decision quick. There is little or no infrastructure, you're going into a terrain that you have no idea what the power would be, what the electricity consumption would be, what the energy needs may be, right? And you have adversaries populating that. So you have all these individuals, you have data in knowledge bases, you have UAVs and you, uh, systems, you have soldiers and you have sensors, and now imagine the red dots are the adversaries who are polluting the things that you are sensing. They are your systems, but the bandwidth or the communication channels have been corrupted. Now take a decision. Can we solve that challenge? 
That is, to me, the next 10 year challenge is how do we figure this collaborative intelligence together and build a decision theater. And we're trying to simulate that with this, where we have a virtual environment, we have a physical environment, and we're figuring out the key interfaces. And the other things that we have to tackle here is it's not just a, an engineering or a computer science problem or a cognitive science problem, or, uh, but human factors. Right? How do we now figure out what are the right choices I should be presenting to the human who is a decision maker? We know our cognitive capacity is limited. We get tired. And the more decisions I have to make, the more tiresome it becomes. Right? That's why if you think about a lot of the uh, you know, individuals espouse the idea of where the same color combinations, the gray and you know, Steve Jobs wear black and blue every day, so he didn't have to think what color he should wear today. That takes some decision thinking, right? Where you're gonna eat doesn't matter. What you're gonna eat doesn't matter. Where you're gonna park doesn't matter. Eliminate things and make them fixed on every single day. Because ultimately, it's an, it's, it's, we are, we are overburdening our cognitive capacities. So that human factors experience becomes very important is what we are trying to see. So this is one of the grandest next 10 years challenge. That if we can focus just on this, we'll achieve so much progress. And that could help us towards our moonshot idea of a Jarvis, if you will. Right? Because this is real world. This is real world. You have different systems with different levels of intelligence. You have adversaries polluting the data, polluting the sensing streams. Things are coming in. I have some mission objectives I have to achieve. The mission objectives change based on the adversary action. I'm constantly reacting there. How fast can I do it? Is a fundamental question here. How do we achieve that? Now, something else that in the last couple of years I've been extremely enamored by, and sort of I realized that we are to achieve our AI next 10 years vision, what, where we want to be, we have to think about thick data. We, have, we know about big data, the quantitative data. Thick data is what, you know, it's, it's a term that marketeers and anthropologists and ethnographic researchers talk about is, my context, my stories, my emotions, and my, hum my, my patterns, right? You, you often hear stories about global health workers who go to a village and they sort of increase the adherence to a health pattern by building their relationships, by understanding where that individual is, what that individual's needs may be, what is the right communication I may do with that individual. That is extremely important. And that's not big data. That's not sitting in a giant big database where I'm sensing from. That data is, built, is in my diary, is in my intuition, is in my model of the world. It's the qualitative data, which we often don't think about. Right? If you're imagining a future where human and machines will be together, we have to imagine a future where we can deal with this thick data which is unraveling my context. If you, the marketing companies could benefit, right? Where you, you think about is that I'm running a, a small campaign where the 100 individuals tell me about things, why they choose something, why they don't choose something, why they like something, why don't they like something. It gives me an intuition that no amount of their online digital activity or persona would tell me. This is another huge issue as we think about the next tick data. So, so in a world, the way to think about this is, in a world where technology is outpacing society's ability and our capacity to absorb and adopt change, every year there's a new iPhone that comes out. You just got to settled to talking to Alexa, who's becoming a permanent date, and now the Google and Apples want to date you as well. Right? Life is tough. Right? So as we are sort of uh, absorbing and adapting to change, things are changing, the systems are changing. Um, apparently, they were thinking something about Snapchat yesterday where they, I don't use Snapchat, but they used their user interface and that led to a number of people. But apparently, what happened was Kylie Jenner said something about Snapchat that dropped the stock market by 7%. Right? <laughs> Come on, right? Uh, I kid, that's 7%. How much of the wealth was lost of in one day? Uh, people are saying it was Kylie Jenner's tweet, but I don't know. I don't even know who Kylie Jenner is, but whomsoever she is, uh, if you're trading in Snap, I'm so sorry. Right? It was Kylie's thick data, the qualitative data, right? which the market was reacting to in many ways. So, so if you're gathering and managing, we have to infer the implications. 
and translate those insights into interventions and actionable opportunities. I'm not sure how many of you have worked in the data analytics space before already, but one of the pet peeves you would hear from a lot of companies, and I've seen that as well, is, oh, analytics is not working. You, I now have this big Hadoop or big data system or this technology system. Magic was going to happen, and it's not happening. Why? A system will produce insights, will show you where the water is, will not walk you to the water. Right? How do we translate those insights into the right interventions and actionable opportunities? And this is where a lot of our thinking now that we are looking at is how do we incorporate different disciplines, design thinking, and what have you. Our friend from SAP is here, and they have sort of innovated the ideas of design thinking into the mix. And, and the reason with that also is that you know, I love this Margaret Mead code, and, and I use it is we are funny people. right? What people say, what people do, and what people say they do are entirely different things. Now, now try and get thick data, right? Now try and get inferences from that because we are we are we are confusing. We are we are confused people, right? Machines would say what they do and they'll do what they say, right? But we people won't. So, and then to give you an idea as to when I began to realize that this thick data that this issues of design thinking, this issue of ethnographic data, the anthropologist, the social science is so much more critical, uh, was our e-senior care project. So we were working with a uh, few years ago. So this so over there is my, was my, PhD, my PhD student, Deepa. And she's, in fact, with SAP now as a user experience researcher. And these were some of her seniors at an independent living facility. So about three or four years ago, we, we decided that we, the innovations that we have done in our lab and the, and the papers and the awards that we have received on those papers as well. Let's see if they actually mean anything, right? And you know, as academics, we, we publish papers, we get recognized for those, and we go, life is good. Look how many citations and grants and things, right? But we say, okay, let's see if this actually works, right? If it doesn't, we'll say we failed, and we maybe we'll write a failure, a paper on our failures. Maybe we won't, but at least we'll know, right? Uh, but the idea, so we sort of went in as, as computer scientists usually are, as cocky computer scientists, thinking we'll bring world peace. My, my student, I, and one of my postdocs, we, we went to the seniors. We said, you know, we signed up, and the memorial hospital system was extremely cooperative. We signed up an independent living facility, and we thought we had the app that will revolutionize aging. We had technology that will change the way the world looks at aging. Literally, we thought that. And then we walk in, and we show the thing to our our friends here, they hated it. And I couldn't understand why would you hate it, right? They basically said, that, oh, it's not, no, it's not. And, and then it quickly dawned, we didn't understand who they are. And that's why if you think all the thousands of apps in the app stores and Google Play stores on healthcare and wellness, they don't seem to work. Nothing seems to stick. Companies come and go in this space. Right? before any change is affected, because changing human behavior, for crying out aloud, is the toughest thing. Right? Because what we say, what we do, are two entirely different things. Right? They, they, that's not easy, changing my behavior. And let's be honest, right? changing behavior is very difficult. So we went in, and, we, and there were small things that they, of course, they hated the experience, user experience. They, they didn't know why, what they were doing. We didn't communicate it properly. And then some, some of the things that we said, what do you do in your home, they, it was offensive. Home is associated with assisted living. They were in an apartment, independent living facility. They were not in a home. We asked what games you play. They said, we are not children. We have hobbies. We don't play games. So these simple things. And we didn't understand their context. We were coming from a lab, and we thought we had the algorithms. We had the ultimate AI powering this experience for them on their tablets, and it wasn't working. So then. Brought in an anthropologist, brought in a design thinker into the team, and we said, and something else that you know, we do well in my group is we're, we take criticisms very well. We are very thick skinned. We're like, all right, you hate us, but give us one more chance. Everyone, you always get second chance, you just have to ask for it, right? If you don't ask, you can go dejected, but a good human quality is keep asking for second chance and you will get it, right? And those were wonderful seniors, and we said, please, please, please. Maybe they saw their children in us. They said, all right. We'll give you a second chance. But he said, give us a second chance. And then we interviewed them. And we had, we had many such interviews. We tried to ask them. We tried to collect their thick data, their qualitative data. Why? What are some of their challenges? And, and you know, 
Here they sort of talked about, I need more involvement. We need social cultural interaction. You need a social community. We asked them, what do you need? We asked them about active lifestyle. They talked about, I'd like to go shopping or physical health. They talked about employment. They talked about providers. They talked about improved access. They talked about closeness to necessities. In our app, we were just looking at the medical data. We were just looking at, the, behave, at the, the data that could be electronically captured. And we were addressing that. We were building them a personalization framework. But we didn't understand. Someone may have access for this. Someone may have a need for this. And if to really make a behavioral modification, you have to fit in that person's lifestyle. Because to make behavioral changes was that easy, then five fruits and vegetables would have stuck, and we would not be number one obese country in the world. Right? We wouldn't be spending $2.7 trillion on healthcare. We can do diagnosis and medical advances are phenomenal. But where we fail is a last mile challenge, taking that intervention with the human outside. So we try to understand and we build this thing out. The other interesting, and we were successful, by the way, and from that, they actually pursued the study. They told their friends at two other independent living facilities without us marketing, and we signed them as well as part of the research study. So the lesson is, it is interdisciplinary. Would we have been successful had we not listened? Would we have been successful had we, if we didn't have the anthropologist? Would we have been successful if we didn't have the design thinker to tell us and, and create those, those sessions with them, those engagement with them? And in the end, they did say that they liked it because they felt we listened to them and we worked with them. They said oftentimes some things have been given to them and the population that I was working with or we were working with had never used technology before. They were, first time they were looking at a smartphone. So they underserved, underinsured, lower socioeconomic uh, uh, parameters uh, 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 and, uh, from that side. Right? So, so how do we now? So, the, and so this was, to me, if, if there was one initiative that has been personally defining and personally game changing and, and really thinking about AI in a societal construct was this. And I'm very grateful to them. They were outspoken. They were driven. They wanted to tell us. They wanted to correct us. They were influential on each other. And then they became our best marketeers because we did it on three, in three different facilities as a result of that. So we are very grateful for that. And not, so that sort of helped form what the challenges are. So now we are working with another group in Brazil uh, called uh, uh, CREN. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a not for profit. Uh, they're located in Sao Paulo. And what they are, their, their idea is. Uh, and Dr. Gisela Solomos, who is sort of the, one, of the, one of the initial founders of this, is going to be a visiting faculty here for an, starting in April. Uh, and um, so she would be here for a year if you want to interact with her. So what they realized was, as they were going to the favelas and the slums in Brazil, children, they realized, they realized that there was issues of malnourishment. And something else that's happening now is issues of obesity because of you know, the staple diet is not is being affected. The rice and beans is not that commonplace anymore. It's getting more processed as well. In fact, in New York Times two days ago, there was an article which said it's not a quantity or quality. Basically, the, the paper published said, let's not worry about calorie counting anymore. Focus on quality of food and eat as much as you can. Essentially, eat whole, whole foods, whole grains, uh, whole everything, and you know, don't eat processed food and eat whatever as much. Of course, why would you want to eat so much of all that? Right? Uh, is another question, but you know, but that's the. But it was, but what they found in that was people have this nutritional advice and everything else. But something that they observed in their interviews, she's a, she's a, she's a social psychiatrist, and the data has been collected where things that mattered were relationships, things that mattered were family circumstances, things that mattered were communities, things that mattered were the mother and child dyad in many ways, and these are crime infested slums in some drug-infested slums, right? So now, and they provide this daycare where children come and they provide them with this nutritional value, nutritional outcome, they cook with them as well. And they see, and in a paper that we'll be soon be publishing with them, we see market improvements in their health data of these children. 
So there's something going on there. There's something that this, that this group is doing. So hopefully we can take some of these learnings in our collaboration with Kren and apply it to solve a global problem where 23% of the children under five years were stunted. 17% under five are severely wasted, which means, uh, uh, and 48% is overweight. These are huge numbers staring at us. And if we want to build an AI system to be high impact, which doesn't lead us to driverless cars or doesn't lead us to this thing, help me solve this problem. That's my challenge to all of you. Can we address this problem of, of our world? Where we are looking at children who are, the, the, the numbers are changing. The parameters are changing. Can we address it? Can we understand in each slum, in each community, in each neighborhood, why those challenges are? That's the thick data. Can we build algorithms to expand on those from that perspective? So the, the three things that, uh, it's, it's, uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's projecting okay for you, but the three things that we looked at, what we're trying to, as we're trying to build this system, what we call Knowledge Hub, I, right now the name is Sherlock Knowledge Hub, because you ask Sherlock and you'll get the answers, or we should call it Jarvis Knowledge Hub actually. Uh, uh, where we are getting the primary data, which is the big data, which is the electronic medical records. We are getting the secondary knowledge, which is about policy, community, uh, location, the population. We are getting all of that data. And then the deep data, which is the deep meaning, which is the thick data that we are extracting from these. So that's my thick data, the deep knowledge. How do we begin to marry these together to build a system? And that is a grand AI challenge. And hopefully what we will build is, we are, we are trying, our vision is to, to approach this where we can put every child into some quadrant and when we say whether it's a psychological challenge, social behavior, anxiety, stress, conflict, these things matter, right? These things matter in a child's health. It's not just giving good nutritional and good clinical support. We cannot ignore the family support that may be needed. We cannot ignore the psychological support that may be needed and, and only then these will work. For these interventions to work, these things have to come together. And then once we do that, how do we now build a knowledge hub that will sort of take care, would have parents, government agencies, researchers, practitioners, and professionals interacting with these. And this is a tough problem, because imagine now, the context of a Brazil favela is different than what we are seeing in Africa now, in Ghana and other places. Chile, there was a news article recently where Chile is facing some of these challenges. Uh, in Indian slums, there are some of these challenges where obesity, diabetes, and among children, they are increasing. It's not just malnourishment, undernourishment, it's also obesity or stunted growth. So how do we... Frame that idea, that thinking, that data, that personalization that we have come to see with Amazon, Netflix, and, and everything else. Can we build an intelligent system? The other thing that, you know, in our group that we are looking at now is looking at the invasive species in the world, right? Where again, if can we build an AI system that can look at, trace how species travel through the world. In the US right now, $120 billion is lost because of invasive species. The species that hitchhike on the ships, ballast, on the boat hulls, and they go from one port to the other, and then they suddenly reach our Great Lakes port and they say, hey, this looks great. And then they uh, overproduce, right? They adapt, and then the local species go, uh-oh, we didn't expect you here. Right? And that's what changes the framework of the, of, the, of the port. Whether it's zebra mussels, Asian carp, there's been a lot of news in it. Can we begin to model that? And we have, we have funded mandates to do this. The other things that we are trying to address is climate change adaptation. Can we look at data, build intelligence systems to figure out what should countries do to be more resilient to climate change, to be more better prepared to adapt to climate change? Again, these are powered by data and systems. And these are things that we are doing here. The personalized healthcare, I already told you, I talked to you about it, where we are building these engines which will drive our vision of personalized healthcare or scientific wellness or scientific health from any perspective. And my goal is, my, my, think, my goal is that each one of us is a slice of the spectrum. I, where you have my genomic data, my age, my demographic attributes, my uh, my provider information, my 
variable fitness, my, my, my uh, patient's interface, my financial, and my policy. Each one of us is a small little slice on this. If we can integrate all that data, truly we can perhaps drive the idea of scientific wellness. We can build a human, just like the music genome, we can build our wellness genome. And we are working hard towards it. If we can achieve this in the next 10 years, it's a great victory moment. So what I'm trying to do is I'm breaking down challenges of what we are working on today and seeing, can we achieve it in the next 10 years? How do we bring all the data together? How do we bring my, my number of steps? How much do they matter? Along with my lifestyle data, along with my electronic medical record data, along with my qualitative data. How does all that come together to inform my health? Because I am a very complex person, and so are each one of you. Each one of us is a huge data, us is a data stream now. How do we bring it all together? And that's, that's what we're trying to push. We're trying to also push, which is a big funded mandate in my group, is harvesting social signals. Can we understand how polarization happens in social media? Can we understand how we create these echo chambers uh, in social media? And, and how, how does news and disinformation and, and information goes in and there is a machine learning feedback loop that has to go in. We don't understand it yet. So yes, while we talk about driverless cars and Jarvis and things, in the next 10 years, if we can achieve successes in some of these things, we have made a huge dent in the next 10 years of AI. And, and that's the key takeaway from uh, a lot of these apps. But same thing goes with social sensing as we are. Now imagine the social sensing, right? Where you are sort of seeing as different events are happening. Right? People are tweeting and social media. That's become the first responders thing. How do, you understand, how do you believe that that information is true? Someone may pick up this thing about an attack and, and broadcast it. It goes to a half a billion WhatsApp people. Like recently, there was a meme that went through which says Sylvester Stallone is dead. I'm not sure if it reached your phone as well. There was this movie shoot of Sylvester Stallone. He was dressed, he, was, he had his makeup on, and they said, oh, he just passed away today morning using that picture of his movie. And that was fake news. How do I trust it? How do I not trust it? Right? So how do we establish this? How do we bring in time, space, content, and all of these things together? Because this is what is going to drive us. And we have to operate in this world. We have to operate in the world where information will come to us faster than we can imagine. Opportunities of knowledge creation would be faster than we can imagine. We'll be connected more than we want. And how do you now distill through all of that and make a sense of the world? How can the machine, and this is where the human-machine partnership I talk about, a lot of these things, the algorithms can be phenomenal at that. But now, but tell an algorithm to figure out whether it's real news or fake news. Tell an algorithm to figure out whether it's a real image or a fake image. Right? Tell an algorithm to translate it correctly. Those are other set of next 10 year challenges that we have to address to achieve this objective. The other thing that we are seeing now is MOOCs and online learning. It's changing the way we learn, perhaps. What does it mean? Are we now trying to capture 140 characters of learning experiences where we see, uh, do we actually read the complete article? We sit down and read the article in New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or whatever your favorite news media, new media may be. Or our news now happens through a tweet, through a news aggregator, looking at the headline, we form an opinion what that may be saying, and we go on from there. And then form information. How do we now build the idea of learning as a university where online learning will be a big mechanism? Yes, how do you define engagement? How do you engage individuals in the online? How do you take away this experience of me looking at you, we us making eye contact? You nodding or you not nodding, or you you are acknowledging this, and me figuring out from your body language that yes, it's making sense or not making sense. How do we do that in a MOOC setting? But we know MOOCs are here to stay. We know online learning is going to be revolutionary, but we still have to figure it out what that means. And then something else that we're also doing is that we have a big grant funded. This was in news in collaboration with Mike, with, with uh, Aaron Striegel at Notre Dame as well, where. We are looking at variables, mobile devices to study workplace performance. Can we understand, based on 
my stress, my heart rate, my other readings, what my workplace performance may be, what other things are impacting me. And there's different sensing that could be done because we are st still trying to understand how it's impacting our world. We don't know yet. We do not know yet. And there's a lot of we do not know in AI in this construct as you're working with humans. So 10 years hence is what I believe at Notre Dame, which we, are, we hope to chart out, that we're doing in my research program and I invite all of you to join us on that. First, a research and training program that pushes the frontier on human machine teaming. The things that I talked about, as I just presented to you a snippet, a microscopic view of what's going on in my lab in many ways. We started with very general applications where we are today as a world, our moonshot idea of having a Jarvis or an Oracle, and then we sort of narrowed it down to say, okay, let's solve these problems that are happening in our center here at, at Notre Dame, what we are working on in our center. And to achieve this, we quickly realized we need human-machine partnership. We need to develop algorithms who can make a better sense of the world. And how do we do that? To in a responsible, rigorous, and engaged way. That's critical. How do we think, create, and work together? And I'm not just saying think, create, and work together as humans. Think, create, and work together as machines. Do we know what happens if a machine guides me to a material discovery? Does the machine own the patent with me? Or the person who invented that machine owned the patent with me because it helped me guide the material discovery? Do we have answers to this? We don't know yet. And that's where what we can do at Notre Dame. And, and we believe that a university education should ensure the students are trained to think about the future, not just to create the future. We are phenomenal in creating the future through our research, through our innovation. We are innovators. We can create, we can innovate, and we move at a, at a blazing speed pace. But we should pause and say, what does it mean? And there's no better place than Notre Dame to pause and say, what does it mean about the future as we are creating it, as we are building it? How does, how, how does it reflect? Let's be more reflective about it and think about responsibility, ethics, society, and policy, because we are in a unique place. I'm very grateful to be in a place where we can have an open dialogue about our innovations and see how is it situated in that perspective. And that's where if we, can, if we can get there 10 years from now, we'll be making great progress. And the way we are approaching this is in a very multidisciplinary construct. I sense as a research center uh, uh, that are direct uh, uh, on campus. And we are working with different research centers, CROC, Center for Social Concerns, Riley, Kellogg, uh, Center for Rare and Neglected Diseases, EC. We are driving in problems from smart and connected communities, design thinking, natural sciences, and what we're hoping to do is we will build a program that sort of says, what's my research problem statement from a humanistic data science perspective? The human side of this data, the human face of this data. Let's define a problem statement from there. And then we build a social engagement and responsibility element of our training program where we have design thinking, context, partnerships, ethics, bias, trust. We bring it into our curricula. As, as we do research, and then we have professional development, boot camp retreats, internships, workshops, and ultimately bringing a, a T-shaped paradigm for thinking together. And what we are hoping is this T-shaped paradigm looks something like this, where we create a curriculum, we create a PhD degree, we create a, a master's degree, or we create minors where students have a responsibility, have, a, have an option to take social responsibility in researchers' training, to take experiences in social engagement. What do we do when we work with community groups? How does it work? How do we translate our ideas to, to have professional development workshop, to have ethics, along with the depth of AI, machine learning, data science, and the societal problem that we are working on? And that could be something in the lab, or that could be some discovery. Or, or, and this is all connected by a framework of design thinking where we learn how to work together, business to computer science, to sociology, to biology, to community partners who have never seen or heard some of these technology innovations that we are talking about, and bring it all together through a design thinking construct or framework. 
and perhaps then we will truly achieve if we, the human and machine partnership. Right? We are working together, and we'll fist bump as well right? uh, from that side. And we'd ask ourselves, right? at Notre Dame, we say, what are we fighting for? And we are fighting for thoughtful human-machine partnership because innovation is not just about technology. It is about people. And why Notre Dame is the right place for this, and maybe the only place for this for we have to start thinking about, is, is I, I quote us from our mission statement. The aim is to create a sense of human solidarity and concern for the common good that will bear fruit as learning becomes service to justice. Thank you for your time. We do have some time for questions from the floor. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much for such informational talk. Uh, so I have a question regarding the next frontier, which you talked about is conversational AI. Uh, and for this conversation AI to be really effective, it needs to get hold of the thick data. So uh, my question is, according to genomics, the data is, you know, is passed through genes. And a human, as a human, we have a 10,000 years history and 10,000 years of information modified according to different regions and a lot of other parameters. Do you think a computer or any algorithm would be sophisticated enough to understand a person and the 10,000 years history? And would it be really a conversational AI? So yes, yeah, so I think so that's a very good question. And that's why I said that to get there, we need to to uh, this is the next frontier because it, it is, we don't know yet what that algorithm would look like. But we are making advances and contributions whether we think about our advances with images, our advances with chatbots, our advances with bringing in the thick data and trying to assess what that means, contextualizing it, bringing in some of these elements. As we start layering these experiences in, we may get to that stage of understanding the human. But because the same challenges apply where you put two individuals from very different contexts together, from different places in the world, they don't know what each other's 10,000 years history of that region may be, right? So they are trying to understand. They're trying to figure each other out. So can the, can the machine now understand those things better and faster at some point? And be able to converse with you where it's reacting, it's listening, it's understanding. It's, uh, and that's why when we talk about, when I said from a medicine perspective, the general diagnosis, my physician-patient interaction will, will be very difficult to be removed because a lot of magic happens in that interaction. We talk about uh, bedside manners of a physician. We talk about uh, that empathetic understanding by the physician of, of, of the individual. Those are the nuances where a machine may, an algorithm will have to pick on and adjust and accommodate. But it will have access to and, and be able to process our 10,000, whatever years history that we want. Right, uh, four billion years since the uh, uh, since the Precambrian era. Right, <laughs> whatever. If as a, there's no human that has that capacity, but a machine does. So my, my hope is that we may be able to advance our technology, advance our algorithms, piece by piece by piece, to start to make more sense of the situation, the context, and the environment. There was a question here. What is, according to your opinion, uh, the most realistic uh, term to, for creating a really safe driving cars? A, a realistic term? Yeah. I mean, in, in the, years. Yes. I think they are, I mean, they are, the, 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 the self driving cars have been tested, and then in Phoenix, they're operating as well, right? So, so I think the self driving cars have been, and you know, there's, uh, are operating in cities. It's, as a technology, I believe we are there. Uh, what we haven't figured out is, human subject testing, where we just let the technology-driven cars work on our streets and see what happens, right? Which we can't easily do, of course. We can't even create a controlled experiment to see how many drivers does it kill, right? Uh, so, so that's where some of the challenges, maybe it's a lot of simulated, but as a technology, uh, I believe it's, it's pretty rock solid. It has to be tested, and as we go through the testing, it'll get more informed, get better. But the technology, in many ways, is, it's been demonstrated already by, by Uber, Google, and uh, uh, ride-sharing companies where they imagine these to happen. Uh, 
So we were, uh, you mentioned that you would uh, prefer robots to be fully autonomous. Now, uh, what I wonder is that we as humans are not quite comfortable with another human being having a lot of control. So how uh, do you see this happening where uh, you have, a, let's call it a creature or an entity which is much more powerful than you, much more faster than you, and takes decisions based on cold logic where you would prefer someone who is more humane so, um, so, I, so I, it's not my preference that, you know, or it, it, I don't have a preference one way or the other that the machines become fully autonomous, but uh, autonomy is a key, right? If today, you, you know, yes, you may be governed by other factors around you, but you still are autonomous. You choose to go where you choose to go, where you're taking decisions, et cetera. That level of autonomy where a, a robot is not being controlled, a robot, is able to, a robot is able to react, a, an uncertainty doesn't result in a catastrophic failure which makes a robot come in a blooper video and, and draws laughters and empathy and sympathy from all of us. So achieving that objective is huge. Once we achieve that objective, then within that context we can think about, and this is where I'm talking about thinking about the future, let's say collectively we can create autonomous robots completely autonomous, which is autonomic, which, is, which, which, is, uh, which can be controlled, which cannot be, con you know, which is, and is, is, uh, is able to adapt, is able to challenge uncertainty, let's say. But then if you're thinking about the right construct, how this robot will operate, what are the biased ethical trust and safety operations that we have to think about, then maybe we are marching along both the lines at the same time. As, 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 as an academic institution, if you think about these things, versus we are you know, build, putting blinders and going, I'm going to make my algorithm and my software to be fully there. So we have to think about these things. I don't have all those answers. But that's the whole point of having a collective thinking about these approaches. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Um, as, um as more and more um, technology goes forward and a lot of devices, are there any areas where, or any res researchers who are concerned about measuring the increasing sea of electromagnetic radiation upon the human physiology uh, based on um, the safe levels that are known? Because the, the reason I ask is because there is a researcher, uh, Goldworthy, in England. He said that uh, five or six years ago, he said that already that calcium ions are being drawn out of brain cells. And we've all heard of the little anecdotal stories of sleeplessness is increasing because melatonin is being torn out of uh, pineal glands. So for, for us to go forward, shouldn't we, uh, is there any measure, anybody keep an eye on the measurements so that these um, increases of electromagnetic radiation uh, do not exceed the uh, safety standards for the human physiology? I don't know if someone is, but that's a very good question. And in fact, this is another question that perhaps we could study with as we are creating the future of these things. What does it mean from that perspective uh, as you know, electronic radiations are increasing and what does it mean for a human brain and, and the physiology of a human physio physiology from that perspective? I do not know. I don't have an answer to that. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I think that's a good question. So yes, it was more of a tongue-in-cheek remark as well, where, hey, we, let's, we provide our data and we just, it's a, transa it's a transaction then, right? If we can quantify and put a value on a data, and I believe that's when the dialogue becomes very interesting, right? Where I say, okay, I need your data. Your data would sort of contribute this much value to me if I can quantify it, right? And then I say, okay, this is the value you're giving me. I'm giving you this service in return. Either you pay me for that service, because I'm, I'm gonna pay you for your data, or we make it free, and then you are getting the service, and then I have to be able to measure using that free service the impact it has on your social well-being, or not your social well-being, right? So that's where it becomes a very interesting question, because I often think about this as we are creating content. We are creating content that lets the system know us better, 
and then the ad, mark, uh, ad market just pop up their ads just because I said, I'm going to Hawaii. And suddenly you'll see Hawaii ads pop up and people is going to, you go to Amazon.com and you go on your Facebook page, you'll see, oh, those shoes are popping up everywhere, man. I better buy those shoes. Something, this, this, there's some uh, uh, message that's coming to me. So we already, there is that happening. And I hope that we get to a place where there's a dialogue about us putting value on data and individuals value on data. And, and some of the things that we are building in the healthcare is that the system that we are envisioning or imagining is uh, imagine a, a system where all of us are CEOs of that organization. And where are CEOs, by virtue of providing our data, our dividends are us learning from each other's experiences and getting a recommendation that makes my health better. I will only, it's a give and take model. Right? We all participate, but we all get something which is deeply more meaningful uh, in health and wellness from that side. Um, but again, how do you begin to create a framework of value is, is difficult to answer. But that, will be, that could become very important as we go along. Because if it's going to be a data economy. If you could all just join me in thanking Professor Chala one last time today. Thank you. We have a token of appreciation for you. Thank you. Thank you.